Good. Thank you, Matteo. Thanks, everybody, for showing up for the last lecture. Let me start sharing my presentation. And uh, I will ask you to confirm if, you, if you're able to see it properly in full screen mode. Yes. It's very good. OK. OK. So welcome back, everybody. So now, after uh, Alex, four lectures on methods to uh, that uh, related to data mining, in particular clustering and dimensionality determination in dimensional reduction, I, I will try to, to, in this lecture, I will merge what we have seen in the first two lectures. So basics uh, of uh, formulating quantum many body problems, quant uh, many body problems in terms of, uh, of uh, data structures and the data tools, the data mining tools that Alex explained it, okay? And so this is now more of a research line and here you find the name of, of the people that have contributed to the specific things that we'll be presenting on today, which are these two papers here on the bottom left. Let me emphasize that, of course, we are not the only one contributing to the general framework of uh, utilizing data mining or more generically unsupervised learning techniques to understand features of many body problems, in particular phase transitions. Uh, there have been a lot of works. Some of these, uh, some of that I will actually mention along the top, but most of it, unfortunately, I have long had time to cover. Let me, however, suggest two rather, rather good reviews. I, mean, I think they're, they're very good, okay? That touch different aspects of what I will be telling you today. They are maybe more on the quantum side, but there, are, there is, of course, also classical results included, and they are by Juan Carlos Quilla, and, and this, the second one by several authors published over the last two years. So in, in case uh, you, you have interest beyond what I will be presenting today, I will strongly suggest that you start from reading these two reviews. OK, so. Uh, the, the idea of today is the following. So at the beginning, I will briefly recap what we said at the end of my second lecture, which was about this strange three cycle easy model. However, I will, in repeating these concepts, I will do that with a slightly different twist. And instead of utilizing the easy model, I will utilize, I will utilize the Eisenberg model. And it will be clear to you why I do that why, when I discuss the data structures. And then we will move on and discuss the main results okay, that, uh, that come out of this merging of data mining and classical stuff Mac. And uh, I will first present you a series of numerical experiments done with Monte Carlo methods on second order phase transitions, first order phase transition, and phase transition which have topological origin in the sense that they are driven by topological defects. And in particular, I will be discussing what is called Berezinski cost and Stowers transition. And while doing that, I will also take a very, very short detour, if time allows, and discuss how spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is a common phenomenon that happens in some of these transitions, it's actually related to clustering data structure. And I will do that utilizing a tool which is called principal component analysis that I'm, that I'm sure Alex mentioned. And then after explaining to you this collection of, of numerical experiments, we'll, we will try to build up a theory for that. And this theory will be analytical work under a given number of approximation. And the main result out of this theory is that it will be able to explain the main feature that we observe, namely that many body problems and their data structure actually simplify the critical points. So there is a kind of emergent simplicity. And we will show how this emergent simplicity actually stems from universality of the problem. And this we will understand analytically utilizing two methods. And then towards the very end, if time allows, I mean, I have just only a small teaser, a short teaser uh, on how to extend some of these concepts to the quantum anybody problem, in particular path integrals. And uh, there, there are serious issues that, that do not allow to just take the classical results and apply them to the quantum one. And I would like just to, give you an idea of what these challenges are from the point of view really of, uh, of data mining yeah rather than physics and then i'll show you some other applications if time allows. 
Okay, so let's go back to our example uh, that we had last time. I mean, instead of taking a three side easy model, today I want to take a three side Heisenberg model. Okay, so imagine that you have three sites and you can label the three states. So these three sites are here, for instance. Okay, they put them on a line, but you can put on a triangle, who cares? The important thing is they are all talking to each other. And uh, we have to define our, our, our problem, our sampling, the sampling problem, and it's very simple. We can label these states by the, all the states in the configuration space of our partition function by just uh, three variables, theta one, theta two, and theta three. Theta is just the angle of these spins with respect to the line or with respect to a plane, it doesn't really matter. It's just a one dimensional representation of these spins. So this implies that our configuration space has nothing but uh, is defined by points in this cube. Uh, sorry, okay. I, I, uh, I'm only seeing the first slide, I think. Uh, okay, very good. So you, you, you don't see a slide now where there are spins and uh, where the, the, there are configurations. No, no, the title that, that's aligning the man about the problem. And yeah, uh -huh. I can see only the first page, I think. Yeah, I'm very good. So let me, let me try again. Then maybe there was a mm -hmm. problem in my slide sharing. Huh, now. So now, can you see actually? Yes. Data mine. I'm, I'm a three-side Eisenberg model. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Uh, the third page. Yes. <laughs> okay. Very good. So I think uh, so. And now, what do you see? Uh, now I can see the third page, but the illumination is too low. I think. Uh, it's too dark. Sorry? Okay, yeah, no problem. Let me, I mean, if it's not a problem yeah. for you, I will just keep uh, moving in this format, okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Where you can see properly, right? Yeah, now okay, I, I can see. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Very good. So thank you for pointing out because I was not able, I was not reading the chat. Okay. And sorry, so, could we see the previous slide? Because we sure. missed uh, the previous slide is just the outline. Thank you. I will send you the PDF at the end of the lecture. It's no problem, of course, together with the updated notes and some exercises. So I want to come back with the with this minimal many body problem, classical many body problem. So now we have this three side. Eisenberg model, and we are labeling all the states with these values theta one, theta two, and theta three, so that each state is represented by a single point inside a cube. And now we want to sample our partition functions. How we do that with respect to the statistical mechanics, we eighty to the minus energy over temperature, and the Hamiltonian is nothing but is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, so it's just spin-spin interaction. Now. We have here two figures, one on the left, which represents the data structure of our partition function at low temperature. So what happens at low temperature? At low temperature, the states that are sampled the most have the state which have the lowest energy. But the states that have the lowest energy in, an anti in a ferromagnet like this are the states where all the spins point into the same direction. So when I fix theta one, I will have theta two equal to theta one and theta three equal to theta one, okay? So this defines on our three-dimensional space, just a line where all the thetas are equal, okay? So you can see it here, even more clearly than in the easy model case, that the intrinsic dimension of the low temperature representation of this simple three-side Eisenberg model is equal to one. This is all the points on the line. Now, on the right, we can do the same thing, but at very high temperature. When, when the temperature is... Now, in this very high temperature case, what happens? All states are equally probable because energy does not matter anymore. So during our sampling, I'm essentially filling up the full cube with points. So I don't think we, I need to explain you that the intrinsic dimension of this data space is not one anymore, but is really equal to three okay? because we are moving in the full dimension of space. Okay? So this is a, kind of a recap of what we have done last time with the easy model, but now with the Eisenberg. 
Note that there is a difference here, which is very important. In the Eisenberg model, I will very, very rarely repeat the same configuration. While in the three site easing model, I will have this repetition problem. I think Alex discussed with you. Now, okay, this is very qualitative. It's three spins. We want to go beyond that, of course. But the, 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 just the, 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 uh, to summarize the message of, of, of our first example, very low intrinsic dimension in order phases and as high as you can get in principle at high temperature. Okay? But now, okay, remember what Alex, Alex told us is that ID is, the, is somehow the minimal number of variables that is required to describe a data set. And okay, that's great. Our example fits into this more uh, because we know in a ferromagnet of a single spin, then we know all the other spins automatically. So the intersection is one. While in an antiferromagnet, since all spins are going on their own, we need really a number of dimension, which is equivalent to the number of spins. Okay? So all of this makes perfectly sense from a data science viewpoint, what I told you. The question is, what about transitions? Okay. Well, the transitions, okay, here I have to put the animation on my own. Uh, imagine that now we want to draw kind of a phase diagram and we have a temperature here, which is our X axis. And we'll have on the left, our ferromagnetic state in terms of dimension one. And on the right, we have this uh, essentially high temperature paramagnetic state, okay? Now, what happens at criticality? Uh, here we have, we can follow two intuitions. The intuition on the left is the real space intuition. Okay? So typically, uh, at criticality, what happens? What is the fundamental feature of, of, of criticality? Okay? Is that the correlation length in your system diverges. Okay? So this implies that spins, which are very far from each other, they are typically very correlated okay? and non trivial in a power law manner, not like in a ferromagnet. Okay? So then one expects that when sampling the partition function, uh, one could find states which are very bizarre. The, the manifold can be very correlated and can be, a lot of states become available. There is, however, a second intuition, which is more, more based on a concept which goes under the name of renormalization group. If you have never heard about it, forget about that. It's just a definition, okay? You will have to trust me for 30 seconds, okay? So this intuition about the normalization group tells us that at critical points, physics becomes universal. What does it mean? It means that in order to describe expectation values of observables or of lower order correlation function, one does not need to know them at any distance, but does only require to know very few parameters to determine all the correlations of whatever observable. In particular, these parameters, they are typically the distance, uh, the correlation function, and some exponents, okay? And in particular, the critical exponents that you have seen, there are also other quantities which are called uh, universal amplitudes, but uh, let me forget about them for a moment. These are just critical exponents. What does it imply? If I can determine correlations with very few variables, well, it implies that I need few variables to describe my system, but this is nothing but the definition of intrinsic dimension. Okay? So even if the manifold is in principle huge because there are many states, it is actually very constrained because it has to satisfy a set of rules that describe how the correlation behaves. So it is in principle, the intrinsic dimension is minimal. Okay? Uh, and so there is kind of this conundrum, I mean, sorry, uh, is which one of this intuition is correct, okay? Uh, so, and now this exactly, uh, this is exactly the question that we posed a few years ago. We didn't know, okay? It's really, they are, op they are predicting the opposite. One is predicting a maximal intrinsic dimension at the critical point. And the other one is predicting the minimum, okay? So, what's the truth? So, first of all, let me stop now. Is it clear what the challenge is now? What are these two tensions? RG a real space, or do you have questions? Okay, there are no questions, so you kind of trust me. 
So let, let's move on. Okay. So in order to, to determine this, we, we did first some simulations. Okay. And now in explaining the simulation, let me start from the simplest model. Is the easy model in 2D on the square lattice. Okay. So the, the, the configuration space are defined by spin variables at the plus one, minus one. So strings of ones and, and minus ones. The Hamiltonian is very simple. It's just uh, the easy model without, trans which are without fields. Okay, so it's just uh, nearest neighbor interaction, ferromagnetic. Who cares? Doesn't really matter a lot. And we know already, of course, this model is exactly solvable. Blah blah blah. We know what the value of the critical temperature is. There is a it's this uh, two point twenty six. Blah blah blah. And this phase transition is conformal. Doesn't really matter for us. But what is important is that its critical exponent nu is equal to one. The one remember the critical exponent nu is the one related to the scaling of the correlation length. Okay. Now, what do we do in practice? Okay. Well, in practice, what we do, we, we run Monte Carlo simulations. And in these Monte Carlo simulations, we have this mark, huge Markov chains that have to be uncorrelated. Yeah? So that's why we need these cluster algorithms that I didn't have time to fully explain to you at the end of the second lecture. But anyway, forget about how we, how we get them. We have these very uncorrelated data sets, and then we analyze them. Okay? We analyze them how? Well, we extract the intrinsic dimension with the 2NN method that Alex mentioned in, you, in his lectures. And for the 2NN methods, we need a lot of configurations. Okay? And typically, we, we deal with configurations over 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Uh, many body configurations. And then how, how we extract intrinsic dimension? Well, we have this probability, I, I recall you, is the ratio between the next nearest neighbor distance and the nearest neighbor distance. In the previous time, RG is the normalization group. Okay. Uh, so this value of mu is, is the ratio between next nearest neighbor and nearest neighbor's distance. And what one does to extract ID, just plots these two curves, one is the, uh, this curve, which is typically called S. I don't know exactly for, what, for which reason. And it plots that as a function of the logarithm of this ratio of distances versus the minus the logarithm of one minus the distribution of these moves. Okay? And this is a typical result that one gets for the easy model. I don't, I don't remember what temperature that is. And you see that this line has, the, the, this curve has the following feature, very, very close to the origin. It's actually a perfect line, straight line. And then at some point for very large values of log mu, then it scatters and becomes different from a line. So the regions where we are interested in is this one, the region of very small uh, log of mu, because this, that's the region which is physically important, is describing our data set at short or intermediate distances. Okay? Instead, this, this points here are typically related to either outliers or, very, or points which are sampled randomly and not particularly important. Okay? And how one does extract, extract ID is just this slope, the slope of this curve. Okay? And here in, in this sample, you can see that the slope is obtained with a linear fit in this gray line. And we do that for various points in our phase diagram. So let me show you the results of this procedure. Okay. So this, in this uh, slide here, what you can see, mm, let me try to optimize a bit the dimension of the slide so that you can see it well. Okay. In the plot here, what you can see is the intrinsic dimension on the y axis plotted as a function of temperature for the easy model for these different linear dimensions of the system. So the gray, uh, the, the red triangles, these are squares of 40 times 40, and then you have larger and larger system size. Now you can see that these curves, so feature the following. I mean, ID decreases very, very close to the critical point, and actually has a minimum, which is denoted by this orange dots. And the minimum, as we increase the system size, it approaches the correct transition point, which is marked by this dashed line. Okay. So these results clearly show us that the intrinsic dimension does not grow 
at the critical point, but actually the opposite. It becomes smaller and smaller as we proceed with system size in the following sense that the minimum of the intrinsic dimension moves, shifts towards the transition point as system size is increased. Okay, so this is a signal that there is really emergent simplicity. So the manifold simplifies the transition point. And this, it's an evidence that the explanation scenario two, RG based understanding, the normalization group based understanding is correct. Okay. So now you can wonder. Marcello, sorry. Uh, yeah. It looks like the points uh, increase uh, as uh, a. <clears throat> Increase uh, in uh, ID as you increase the system yes. size. Yes, the, the, the value of the dimension increases. Okay. But what is important is not immediately the value of the dimension because then you can wonder is it fair to compare the intrinsic dimension of a data space of a spin system which is L, L, 40 times 40 with a data space of a spin system which is under 20 times under 20? Okay. And then you can tell me, look, it is not fair to compare directly the dimensions. Okay? The reason is that is because the embedding space is very different. Okay? Mm. The only thing that, that is really important uh, in our understanding is what are the features, where are the features of these curves uh, leading? Okay? And then this is where the important point is, is that the features describe a minimum which shifts towards the intrinsic dimension, even if the value of this minimum depends on the system size. Actually, it also depends on how many samples we take. Now, this is another mm -hmm. point that I will not touch in these lectures. There is an intrinsic dependence in this classical partition function on the number of samples we take. This is non-trivial, and we only understand it uh, heuristically. Okay. I will not, I mean, uh, maybe I, I will comment on the very end because it's way too much. Now, really, here the point is that the, 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 the minimum shifts towards the transition point as system size increases. Okay. Now, the following question is, well, if this is related to RG, this has to uh, show some so, unique. Hello. Yes? Uh, there is a question on what is RG? Ah, a normalization group. RG is a normalization group. Okay, no, okay. RG is renormalization. Uh, so the question is, is if this is just related to something that signal us where the transition is, or if there is, if the data structure really becomes universal. Okay? And in order to understand that, one has to do an analysis, which is uh, which is, is based on, on an hypothesis, which is called finance size scaling hypothesis. And this finance size scaling hypothesis tells us that an observable displays universality if it is described by this equation here on the left. So we, where L is the system size, uh, zeta is just a number. It's actually a combination of critical exponents. And the important point is this F function. And this F function is a scaling function. This is implies that a function of only chi divided by L, uh, uh, xi divided by L, where xi is the correlation length. Okay? So this implies that if we take our value of ID for the different uh, various different temperature, various different system sizes, and we rescale the, the system size and the temperature with a given scaling, which is, uh, which is uh, determined by the correlation length scale, which it is known, is t minus tc, um, is one over t, t minus tc to the new, where new is the critical exponent. Yeah? So if we perform the scaling and we also rescale our ID, we have to have obtain that all of the curves collapse into the same function, very same function. And this is shown here on the plot on the left, where on the right axis, we have the rescale temperature, T tilde, doesn't matter what it is. And then we have the system size L scale with an exponent one over nu, where nu is, a, is one of our fitting parameters. And on the left axis, we have ID times a rescaling function L to the minus, minus zeta to reabsorb this first factor. And here you can see all the curves that we had before. Remember, I mean, there were many system sizes. There were nine system sizes, uh, tens, if not hundreds of temperatures that we take here in our fit. 
all of them fall into this single slope. Okay? Single curve, actually, it's not a slope. And there are only three parameters that we use to fit. I mean, the critical temperature, value of nu and value of, uh, of zeta. And one can see, this is, this is what we call uh, evidence of universal behavior, where this happens. And this implies that in what, what, what is happening in data space, it is really that there is a structural transition, which has the same universal properties of the transition in real space. Okay? So if you want, it's like when you look at ice, when it melts, we think about ice, uh, ice as a, as a transition. And, and the point is, if you try to reformulate ice in a data space, which is a very abstract object, well, ice also melts in data space with the same critical exponent. Can you briefly explain finite size scaling? Uh, OK. The finite size scaling hypothesis, uh, let me see if I can briefly explain it to you. Well, it, it's essentially telling you the following. Uh, it's telling you that in the vicinity of a critical point where the correlation length of your system is of the same order of the size of the system itself, that because you're starting at that finite size, in that specific regime, all low order observables like two point correlations and so on and so forth, everything which is governed by RG, if you wish, behaves in a, in a manner which reflects the fact that when you will scale the system to infinity at some point, your system size will, will eat the correlation length. Okay? Only precisely the critical one. Now, under this hypothesis, there are correlation functions behave, and this is one, one sample of these equations. Okay? And if you are interested in a, in a that you look at this, Review by Pelisette Bikari, which we just played. You are breaking. What time breaking? Is the connection fuzzy? Uh, yes, the connection is a little bit fuzzy at times. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, if it keeps being fuzzy, let me. Okay, let me do the following. I close this thing. Oh, everything should be closed. Okay, so now it's probably, is it better now? I think so. Okay, good. Let me go ahead and, uh, but let me know if, if there are further problems. Okay. So that's what this stuff is telling us. And uh, there is an additional point, which is a bit more quantitative, because you see from the speed parameters, like the temperature is, is kind of okay, the correlation critical uh, exponent is kind of okay. We want to see if we can do better. So for instance, what we can try to do, we can try to plot the position of this minimum that we were observing before versus temperature. Okay. And this is what we get if we try to plot that position of the minimum as a function of inverse system size against with a critical large system sizes that predicts a critical temperature, which is 2.278, blah, 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 which is a order of 1%, less than 1% away from the expected critical temperature. Okay? So this correlation function, this understanding of, of uh, many body problem in data space is not only useful to, to characterize the many body problem on its own, but is, uh, is at a quantitative level accurate enough that it allows us to determine properties of transition. And notice here, I've not told you what the transition is about. I didn't tell you what the other parameter is about. I just throw you the data. Okay? You just have to analyze the data, and without having to know what the transition is and so on and so forth, you are able to get the correct critical point with a, with a precision which is less than a percent, okay? which is kind of non trivial, I would say, because essentially fully assumption free. Now, I mean, there is a very easy critique to everything I told you is that the easy model on the square is a very simple model. Okay? It's exactly soluble and so on and so forth. So the question is, do these data structure features uh, actually signal universe? And in order to, to answer this question, we did the following. 
So we studied a set of models that are known in statistical mechanics as Q-state POTS models in two-dimensional square lattice. And the idea of POTS models, for those of you th that have not heard about them, is just their simple generalization of, of Ising in the following sense, that instead of having variables that can only take two values, we have variables, the sigma j's, which can take Q values, so from zero to Q minus one. And this implies that our data space is defined by not binary numbers, but uh, Q, Q valued numbers. And the corresponding energy functional is not only counting if two spins are both plus one or minus one, but it's actually just a delta function that close by spins have to point into the same direction. There's a ferromagnetic formulation of the POTS model. Now, this POTS model is richer, it's not fully soluble in general. However, the transition point can be determined analytically and follows this formula, you see, equal to one over the log of one plus square root of Q. What is interesting is that the nature of this transition changes as a function of the states that we include as a function of Q. And in particular, it is second order for Q equal to three and four, and it's first order for Q larger than four. So what we can do now with these POTS models is that we, we can check two new scenarios. First is a secondary transition, which is not as easy as the easy model, okay? and also who has a different new exponent. And second, we can check a first order transition. So what happens there? And let me show you directly the results. So these are the same results that I showed you before for this model now for the three-state POTS model. So on the first plot, you have the ID versus temperature. Again, it displays a fissure which has a minimum, which moves towards the transition. So emergent simplicity is still happening. The second plot is this collapse scaling from finite size scaling uh, theory. Okay? And again, the curves collapse very well. There are a bit of outliers here for uh, on the left side of the transition. I think they are mostly due to the fact that we don't have enough uh, accurate estimates of ID there, but uh, there are really, it's really not physics here, it's mostly a computational limitation. And then again, out of this, we can try to attempt a finite size scaling estimate of the critical point position, TC, and also of the critical exponent, nu. And the critical point position, you can see here on, on the plot on the right, we estimate with this linear fit with the red curve, it is very, very close to expected one. Again, the error is of the order of 1%, more or less. Likely limited to, uh, due to the fact that we really can't go much larger in determining the determination of physical systems. The Monte Carlo simulation is not particularly difficult, but it's the determination of ID which becomes challenging. Okay. At the same time, we can ex uh, estimate nu, and the value of nu that we get is 0 0.805, which tells us two things. Of course, we don't get always one, only that's a good sanity check that our easy model was not just, we were not just getting one because the easy model is particularly simple. It's really, we were getting the correct critical exponent. And it's also rather close, again, at 1%, even better uh, than the expected critical exponent, 4.5. Okay? So that's a confirmation of what, of what uh, we have learned from the two, uh, two uh, for, uh, for easy model. But now we can move beyond second order critical points, and we can understand what happens at first order. So this is an example taken from the eight state POTS model, where the transition is actually relatively strong first order, OK? So the correlation is not, it's not so small. And on the left, you see a plot of the intrinsic dimension versus temperature. And now what you see is something which is not what we had before, that we have our nice minima and so on and so forth. Well, all the curves look like they want to have a minimum. Look at this yellow curve. Who likes to have a minimum? But then it jumps very, very close to the critical point. And this is happening. The larger the system size, the better you see this jump. So the qualitative description here that, uh, that emerges out of our simulation is that actually the intrinsic dimension experiences a kind of a discontinuity in the form of a, of a local maximum when you approach critical temperature. And we try to estimate the position of this maximum with these uh, yellow dots. It's not so easy, huh? that, uh, that's what, what we try. And why it is happening like this? Why is the intrinsic dimension of the data set 
exploding? Well, the reason, as, uh, as I anticipated you last time, is that at first or the first transition, we have coexistence, we have metastability. So there are two orders juxtaposing. Okay? What does it imply in data structure? Well, in data structure, it implies the following. Suppose that you have paramagnetic orders here, and you have ferromagnetic order at low temperature. Okay? They are typically described by very different states. Okay? There can be, of course, an overlap, but the states are very different. So what happens at the critical temperature is that these two huge clusters actually merge. Okay? So the intrinsic dimension locally of, of the data set explodes. Okay? Obviously, it does not diverge because it's still limited by the largest of the two, okay? even though this is not just a direct sum, of course. But it is very, very large. Okay? And a signal of this metastability is exactly what is happening here. Okay? There is really kind of an increased complexity of the data structure at first order phase transitions. Now, is this also related to universality? The answer is yes. This is not the same universality that you have at critical points. It's what is called uh, dimensional scaling, if you want, or mean field scaling. Even the wind is not exactly mean field scaling. So what happens in practice is that the critical temperature scales to its correct value in the thermodynamic limit, not with a critical exponent nu, but with an exponent which is just d, okay, the dimension of the system. And that's exactly what we find in our numerics, which are depicted here. And so the blue line is the correct value in the thermodynamic limit, and the red line is our fit to the numerical data with the correct value of d, which is two in our case. So uh, what else? Okay, this is what I told you about the data structure. So so far, is there an example in data science linking the Griffith phase and the structure of critical? Ooh, um, well, when I think about Griffith phases, but maybe you have to correct me and because you might mean something different. Uh, I mean uh, phases where somehow, which are characterizes, characterized by uh, non-trivial transport properties, but this is typically in disordered systems. It's not immediately related to criticality, or do you mean something different? Excuse me. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, for the systems that uh, have a, a mini critical point, not just one critical point. Yes. Uh, ah, that's what you mean with yeah, yes. ah. uh, I don't know. We have not studied them. If the point is really multi-critical, I don't see fundamental reason why conventional criticality should not work. But since I have not tried explicitly, I cannot confirm this. So, Marcello, the, your video is a little bit broken now, and also the audio. I don't know if you can do anything so, about Let me do like this. Uh, let me... Okay, I will share on the PDF because I think it's it's better than Keynote. So give me just a second, I stop sharing. Because I think that was probably the main reason why. I've just noted that also locally, my slides are a bit slow, which is, uh, which is probably due to that. Okay, doing that. And, and this might be due to the fact that there are a lot of data points. Okay. So, so far, uh, in both of these models, we have only dealt with, uh, with the phase transitions where there is an underlying symmetry that gets broken. So we move from a paramagnet to a ferromagnet. And then the natural question to ask next is whether we can find interesting features in the data structure that have universal behavior also in the cases of where this where there is no symmetry break, in particular if there are topological. And the example that we took, you know, is the XY model. Okay. So, and in two dimension. Matteo, can you? Yeah, you so it's still a little bit uh, Maybe if you switch off the camera, maybe that would be better. I don't know. Yeah. 
Okay. Let's try. Yep. Let me try. Let me try. Okay. So, uh, what is happening in these XY models is that uh, there is a transition as a function of temperature, but this transition is not signaled by any local order parameter. Okay? Even though we have a ferromagnetic phase at low temperatures, the transition occurs through the condensation of what are so-called topological defects, okay? symmetry breaking. Okay? And for the specific of the 2D XY model, the critical temperatures, it's, it's a call, it, it lies in the so-called Berezinski constant Taules universality class. And it appears at a given value of the, of the temperature, which is 0 0.89, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what happens to the data structure in this case? Well, these are the results. Again, from numerical simulations. And on the left, you find intrinsic dimension versus temperature. And while at very, very small system size, you actually see no features. So the intrinsic dimension, for instance, of the smallest system size, 30 times 30, is this black line. It's just a monotonous curve. By increasing system size, you start noticing that there is indeed a minimum developing. Okay? And the minimum is marked by, this gray, uh, by these yellow dots. Yeah. However, the minimum is not very close to the transition point. You see the transition point is marked by the dashed line. This is strange at first, but is actually consistent with the finite size scaling theory of BKT, which is described by this equation here that tells us that the, that the Finite size scaling of the critical temperature is not approaching the correct BKT temperature with a power law, like we have seen in second order transition, but is actually approaching that with one over log square scaling. So it's extremely slow. Approaching criticality is extremely slow. And it's actually confirmed on this plot here on the right, where we have on the left axis the critical temperature extra extracted as a minimum position of these yellow dots here. And on the right axis, we have one over log square L. And you see all these points are close to each other. They are very different system sizes, but one over log square makes differences very small. And you see that if, I mean, apart from the first two points, which are a bit off, probably because the sizes are too small, one can see that these points line perfectly on a line, which is consistent with the scaling, and they get a critical point, critical temperature, which is of the order of 5% within the expected value. However, in my opinion, an even better uh, statement can be made, even a stronger statement can be made by studying the collapse scaling. Okay, collapse is again, not against the power of the, of the temperature and on the system size, but as a different shape, which I will not bother you with, uh, but is just very similar in spirit to what they've done for secondary transition. And here are the results plotted for very different system sizes from 50 to 110 spins over a pretty broad range of temperatures. And all of them collapse into the same universal curve that is depicted here. Okay. So we can say out of these results that even for topological transitions, data structures have universal behavior and the universal behavior reproduces the correct expected critical properties like the correct scaling and the correct temperatures. So that's the, sum, the summary part on the, on the numerical side. And the, the, the question is, can we get analytical insight on why this happens? But first, I would like maybe to pause. And if some of you ask questions on these simulations, I will take them now. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I can I can tell you a bit about the theory. I'm not sure I will be able to tell you everything, but uh, I want to give you some ideas at least. So the first, I mean, first we, we can decouple the question in two parts. Okay. The first part is why I is the ID? Please, please tell me. Uh, does this ID that you found as a critical exponent have any other, you know, in a, a scaling relation with any other critical exponent? Uh, the answer is no. In the following sense, we only know we get the critical exponent nu, and this is the same one of the critical theory. 
So ID as the, as the same critical exponent of the correlation length. Mm -hmm. However, we were not able to determine whether ID can also be connected to other critical exponents, mm -hmm. like Z, uh, Z, for instance. This we do not know. And from the analytic explanation, I will also tell you why we can probably get only new. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about the theory. First, I want to tell you why ID is transition, and then I will try to argue why this shall indeed exhibit universal scaling behavior. Okay. Well, the why is the ID um, singular? Well, the idea is, is very simple. And as Alex told you, ID, the is actually sensitive to scale. So it really depends, the, the specific sample that we're using is sampling a given length scale. So that ID is sensitive to changes of the data structure at the given scale. How does it do that? Well, it is very hard to understand in general, but let me take the, the a drastic simplification, and instead of looking at really the intrinsic dimension, let us perform dimensional reduction with the PCA and analyze what the corresponding figures of merits are. Okay. And I want to mention that there is this beautiful paper by Lei Wang, on, on, which is the first analysis of PCA in this model. We are not doing the same thing, but this is really a paper that was very important for us, and I think it's very beautiful. So on the right here, you can find the, the analysis of the two principal components, or the two, two most important components, the principal components, at low temperatures on the left and at high temperature on the right. And you can clearly see from these pictures that at um, also in addition to the principal components here, we are encoding the average magnetization in our points with colors. So if the average magnetization is plus, this is blue. If it's uh, minus, this is uh, red, okay? That's how the points are colored. And you can see that at very low temperature, our data structure features two clusters. They are made out of very similar states and they have distinct magnetization. Instead, at high temperature, essentially all states are equally important. Our principal components is just a single, indicates that there is just a single huge cluster made of very different states, okay? So there is kind of a very fundamental change in the data structure, even by just looking at clustering. Okay? And in order to understand this a bit in a more quantitative manner, one can compute the following. One can compute a global ID, which is the one that we compute with the principal component by essentially doing the following, by taking all states. Okay. And this global ID approaches one in the symmetry broken phase in essentially that only magnetization uh, in, the, in the symmetry broken phase, because at that point, only magnetization is really required um, to describe the data set. We have two very large separate clusters. We just need to label them with the plus and one, plus and minus, and we are done. And one can see that in this plot here as a gray line. Okay, so at very low temperature, this is essentially flat, and I can tell you the value is one. And oppositely, in the high temperature, this would be very large, of course. Then we can define something a bit different, which is not the ID of all the states, but is the ID of all the states projected in a fixed magnetization sector. So we, on purpose, select only states which have average magnetization plus. Now, in the high temperature phase, this does not matter. And indeed, the red curve and the green curve at high temperature have the same behavior. But what happens? In the low temperature phase is very different. In the low temperature phase, essentially, ID is not probing this uh, dichotomic structure of the data structure, so plus and minus, but it's actually probing the internal structure of each cluster. Okay? And this doesn't have to be small. Okay? And actually, in our case, it's large because it's diagnosing fluctuations. And that's the reason why this local ID as very, is very large at high temperature, but it's also very large in semi-symmetry broken temperature. And it features the minimum at the transition point. Now, it has to, the, the feature, the fact that this is a true minimum with minimum assumptions. Now, one can draw out of this simple PCA analysis the following universal picture. Okay? 
that data structures across phase transitions, they have three regimes. They have a regime where the temperature is very small, where we have a number of clusters that corresponds to different quantum numbers of our theory. In the easy model, there will be two clusters. If there will be three state pots model, there will be three. If we were dealing with the XY model, we will have a number of clusters which are labeled by the winding number. Okay. And then the intrinsic dimension is large because it's able to see fluctuation at the local scale inside each cluster. Oppositely, at T very much very large, essentially we will have all quantum numbers together. And the intrinsic dimension will also be large because it's seen just a single cluster which can have which is globally distributed. So we have seen in the, in, the, in the first slide, this is typically very large intrinsic dimension. Now, what happens close to criticality is that a given number of these clusters, actually all of them in a specific manner, start merging because they start being composed of states which are very similar to each other. Okay? And in doing so, the important degree of freedom here is not anymore the local ones, which are typically very large, but it's the global one defining the changes of quantum numbers. Okay? So this implies that the intrinsic dimension close to criticality where these clusters start merging, it's somehow minimal. It's minimal in the sense that it's now describing only how these quantum numbers changes. Right? So this is the qualitative picture that we get. And this is, it's important to note, it is irrespective of the nature of the transition. Okay? It only relies on the fact that we need to have labeling of excitations at low energy. This is applicable to second order, this is applicable to topological. It does not matter how these quantum numbers are defined. Okay. Uh, now, can we now go beyond this heuristic picture and do some analytics? Really write down how the intrinsic dimension depends on the correlation length and on the critical exponents. The answer is yes, we can do that. We have to do, but since analyzing a data structure is not an easy task, we have to make a certain number of assumptions. Let me try to explain you this assumption and then I will just flesh this out. I mean, remember how we compute ID for a many body problem. It's not that we are looking at all the states, okay? We are looking at the final sample and then we draw these pictures of the distribution uh, uh, as a function of, the, of this, uh, uh, this variable mu, which is the ratio between next nearest neighbor and nearest neighbors. Now, the assumption that I wanna make is that okay, since here we have a line, we assume that the slope of this line, which is ID, only depends on the first point. So we know that this line has to touch the origin. We say, that, okay, the first point determines the slope of this line. Brutal assumption, by the way, okay? So this implies that ID as described by this simple R2, one and R1, one are nothing but the nearest neighbor and the next nearest neighbor distances corresponding to the smallest values of mu that we can have. The point of, of our line is not just a random state, in the, it's not defined by a random state in the inverse space. No, it is defined by a state which has this lowest, lowest energy. And this, it's a kind of very reasonable assumption because first, it is very likely that we have sampled this state or a state very close to that at whatever small that this is extremely reasonable. And also it is also very reasonable that this state has the smallest ratio of next nearest neighbor and the nearest neighbor because excitations on the top of the ground state, if they're local, they, they also tend to have very low energy and they are similar to the ground state in configurations, right? So this second assumption is actually very reasonable. Then, there is a third assumption that we have to make because still, I mean, the ID does not depend on real space correlation function, it depends on correlation between the configurations that we have collected in our Markov chain. And the third assumption is that configurations over the Markov chain, between the correlation between configuration in a Markov chain are equivalent to real space correlations, okay? Now, this assumption, it is very hard to prove, of course. We have an argument of why it should work, is analytical, I will not have time to present it to, to you here, but I want to show you a numerical proof of that, okay, of this third assumption. And these are, uh, these uh, quantities are two computed for the easy model for two different system sizes and also for XY model for two different system sizes. Let us do just uh, the plot on the type, which is the XY model. 
Now, the analytical prediction based on this assumption that I told you predict these green lines, these dashed lines that I can show. Now, you can see that these green lines are in very good agreement with the numerics, which are these uh, red points and uh, red uh, squares and blue triangles. So, this implies that this is in principle completely nuts assumption. A cor correlation between configuration are equivalent to real space correlations, so mirror correlation. It is actually holding true for data structures. Okay. And it's true also beyond its expected validity regime, which is in principle very small temperature. Okay. It's actually true. Now, based on these heuristics, what we can do, we have three steps. Okay. First, first assumption is only the first point. Then we can write the first point as a series of correlation functions that we call this F2, F4, F6, Fp denotes p-point correlations. And then we, but these are correlation between configurations. And then we make this third assumption that these are cor correlation functions at equilibrium. And now you can see that most lowly decaying correlation function at equilibrium is two points. If we plot here, if we write ID, is proportional to one divided by the logarithm of this correlation function. Well, this correlation function decays are exponential of minus r divided by psi. So this implies that id is proportional close to the critical point to the inverse correlation length. Okay. So this is proving two things. First, id as minimal as to be minimal at the, at the critical point because it's the largest correlation. It will not go to zero because this is only the first correlation. Of course, there will be other stuff that make it finite, but it has to be minimal. What is most important here is that this predicts universality, okay? Because it implies that the data structure is governed, close to criticality, by the same critical exponents that govern the behavior of the correlation line, and indeed, nu. Okay, so that's uh, okay. One can derive the very same uh, equations, or almost the same equation, also utilizing maximum likelihood. This will only use one of the assumptions that we have. Told you. However, the derivation is a bit more messy. Uh, I think we do probably presented you maximum likely. You can do it on your own, or it is done in our paper. It's actually a few lines, but uh, it's a bit tricky. And uh, I think I, I, I will skip the quantum mechanical part. In principle, one can utilize what, what, what I told you uh, about classical partition function, also two-path integrals, but there are some unexpected challenges. That's just a demonstration that everything at the end works, but I will not go over it now. Uh, so let me go to the conclusion. So what I promised you at the beginning of the course is that there, uh, there will be fruitful interactions between data science on one side and statistical mechanics on the other, and in particular leveraging on the concept of universality. Okay? And I, I hope you that, that I convince you that data structure of many body problems are just not collection of random numbers, not just random ensembles but they have unique characteristic properties, okay? They have features of emergent simplicity. So, and this suggests that maybe there are other ways of characterizing complexity of many body systems by leveraging on, on these simple data science tools that we know how to, uh, how to, uh, how to apply to objects such as a partition function. But not only that. I mean, what I find particularly intriguing is that universe, I mean, structure, data structure of many body systems are universal, okay? So they are not messy, they are perfectly ordered in the same way we think of many body systems in terms of correlation function and spectra. The data structures also have this universal behavior. And I would say even more so to some extent. And this might be useful in the future if we want to understand many body systems, for instance, developing new algorithms that leverage on the fact that we don't have to uh, search for our physical properties in a messy data space, but we know how to constrain that to a universal one. And I think that what is also interesting, maybe at the more qualitative level, and this is still need to be developed, especially in the quantum mechanical case, is that data structures also have qualitative signatures of uh, physical behavior. We have seen one example is about metastability in first order phase transition. And there can be other, we just do not know because we have not studied them so far. And I think it will be interesting in the future to understand whether data structures can enable new insight on many body problems. 
that are very hard to capture by analyzing them with conventional tools. Okay, I think I'm done. So thank you all and I'm happy to get questions. Excuse me, I have a question related to the, the exam. Uh, if it's a good time, I can wait. Yes. Uh, why why is it on the 28th of uh, April? Because it's the 28th of April. I don't know, why are you asking this? I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, almost like a month and a half from the end of the lectures. It was so just I, okay, so that I, mean, I think we, we have done it for several reasons. And one of the reasons is that you guys have time to absorb things and you are not rushed through. We know that you have other exams. We didn't want to put a page which is too close because it would have not been good for some of you. So we put a single date to do it fine. Okay, it was just uh, my curiosity. Thank you. No problem. So questions. Curiosities, whatever. I mean, that's, uh, a lot of this is work in progress, so don't be Professor, scared. I have a question, but I think it's a very stupid question. I'll ask anyway. Uh, I really didn't understand at the very uh, start of the lecture, um, what was the intuition that uh, uh, led us to think that uh, if the correlation length uh, diverges, uh, we should expect also the intrinsic dimension to become very large. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did not explain it in detail. So it's not that your question is stupid at all. It's just my information was very short. The idea was the following. So if you have a very large correlation length, you typically think that states which are very different from each other, they are equally represented in the, in the partition function, naively. And the reason why you say so is because the correlation length is large. This implies that it's true that two spins at large distance are correlated, but they are correlated in a polynomial manner. So I can have uh, clusters which are very different shapes. And to some extent, in the context of the easy model, one can also see that at criticality, because at the critical point, one has states which appear in the partition function, which are very different. They are clusters of spins, but all of them are arranged in a different manner. Okay? So naively, you will say, it, okay, these are points in data space which are all very far from each other because I'm flipping all the spins. So they're at maximum distance. They will cover my full cube if you want, mm. uh, naively. But the reality is that it's true that they connect your full cube, but they do it in a very precise manner. So I can have points very spread in a three-dimensional space, but only define a cylinder, for instance. Mm -hmm. And this okay. is what happens. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Uh, can yeah. you go back to the slides uh, where you uh, uh, connected the uh, twisted parts model and Ising model? Uh, I guess I mean uh, the slide 12 and 7, maybe the plots, actually. Yes. So you, you want this one? Uh, uh, I or think this. Uh, this. OK. Uh, what is your question? Yeah, yes. uh, the previous one. Uh, I mean, I want to make sure that I saw this correctly. Uh, uh, at the critical point, okay. IT uh, uh, decreases as uh, the system size grows, right? Uh, yeah, well, at the critical point, ID features a minimum, and the minimum moves towards the transition as the system size grows. Okay. okay. Cheers. So there's a question in the chat about um, um, the... Ah, very good question, actually. Yes, it's an excellent question. How general is your third assumption in the frame of Marco C. Monte Carlo? We are trying to understand this. It is, uh, it is not clear. Uh, we believe that it, it is possible that our assumption actually is true in general for a Markov chain. Because Markov chain are not just random data structure. They are data structure which have 
specific ordering, and so on and so forth. So it could be that analytically one could prove that our set assumption, it is, a, it is not an assumption. It is actually true for Markov chains, but uh, we, have, we have tried, we have failed so far. But uh, well, if you're an expert in Markov chains, I will give it a try. I'm not an expert. Maybe that's why we have not managed to do that. Uh, yeah, it could be that this is not an assumption. It could be. It's a very interesting point, by the way. You will send reference to the matrix. I will send everything on the matrix group. I will send the slides, additional references. You will have everything. Okay, so there are no further questions. Then I think uh, we can uh, thank uh, Marcello again and uh, take a uh, uh, 10 minutes break uh, before the next lecture by Edgar. Thank you very much, Marcello. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you all. Bye.